Oh, hello, Rob. You've caught me mid-sip. <laughs> oh, how very well brand branded you are today. <laughs> hello, everybody, and welcome to the How To Be Great podcast with me, Rob McNichol, and me old pal, showbiz Paul Benson, perfectly poised in his Hooked On Wrestling hoodie and holding his Hooked On Wrestling mug. You are so on brand today, my friend. I'm trying. I'm trying. Hello, everybody. Yeah, Rob um, and Chris constantly outfox me on the branding. So I'm trying to trying to brand up a little bit, trying to trying to get the tone up slightly, you know. So here I'll we are. I'll tell you what's impressive. What's impressive is just as we were having our little production meeting before we went live, you were <laughs> drinking out of a, an Undertaker live, live <laughs> mug, which we've been giving away on the Sunday night quiz just lately. And then when we switched back, you'd got your uh, your hooked on one. So that's pretty mean- impressive. This Undertaker last ride mug. I've got. That's the one there. So you are you. Have you actually have you actually put stuff in both mugs or were you was it oh, a no, gimmick sip? No, they're both they're both full of tea. And by the way, sponsored by <laughs> wweeurosharp.com. There we go. Nice tra- nice hologram on the Thank bottom. You to our I, friends. Might, I, might, I might write the web address for the people who are watching this on video. I might start writing a web address on the bottom of my hooks on wrestling mug. Let's let them sponsor us properly first. Let's get some spondulics across the across the uh, table, Deal. and then we'll start putting some uh, some banners up. Uh, for those Deal. who aren't watching this on YouTube, we should explain. Uh, so, if you're listening to this on a podcast, uh, wherever you are in the world, you're very welcome. Hello, um, and if you're watching this on a video. You're also very welcome and hello. But there is uh, videos of this on our YouTube channel. And this is our, a podcast on your usual podcast providers, including Spotify. So there's lots of places. Uh, if you can't see us, Paul is all branded up. I, however, have a Becky Lynch shirt on. I am drinking Sasha's Gold out of a Peroni glass. And if you're wondering what's going on with my hair, it's not an Alice band. But I have, I have got my sunglasses in my hair because I'm so damn sick of pulling my hair over my ears because I haven't had my hair cut since the middle of January. Um, but um, Paul doesn't have that problem because he just buzz over, Indeed. buzz all over, and uh, we move on. But you didn't come here for tips on drinking tea. You probably didn't come here for uh, for Rob's hair care um, advice. What you probably came here for was the How to Be Great podcast. If this is your first time with us, once again, you're very welcome. What we do on this podcast, we take a topic from wrestling, one of its tiny little minutiae or a broader topic. And we discuss it for an hour or so, depending on how it goes. And then we try and break down into our top five of a given topic. So all sorts of things we've done so far. We've done things on our favourite theme music openings. We've done uh, our favourite, um, uh, what did we do? Our favourite drop kick we did earlier on, ladder match performers, all sorts of things we've done. Two weeks ago, because that was the last time we did a, a podcast, it was a fortnight ago, uh, we did the best tag team performers that is to say individual wrestlers that were great in tag teams shortly we'll be giving you the uh, the answers or the results i should say for that so but we'll take our topic today and we'll go through it we'll come up with five between paul and i we'll wrestle about for a little bit and then it'll be over to you on our website i think it's coming along the bottom of our screen just now where you can go hooked on wrestling.co.uk forward slash vote uh, and you'll be able to choose your favourite once we get to the end of this show. But as I say, Paul, it was two weeks ago uh, that we did our last podcast. Uh, last week, uh, Paul was away holiday walking in the North Yorkshire Hills. My computer had a meltdown, um, so we just left it for a week. But we are back up and running now, uh, and we can give you the results of two weeks ago when we discussed the best tag team wrestlers. Paul, you have access to the results. You never tell me the results before we go on air. This is a genuine um, moment for me. I'm really, really looking forward to finding out who's won this because normally most weeks I would say I think that's the favourite. I genuinely am not sure here. No, and I would say the same. Interestingly, and I'm going to come to see your guests in a little while, but interestingly, there's a couple of firsts this time out. First time um, that every single option in the poll has had at least a couple of votes. That's never been okay. the case for there's, there's always been at least one that's had uh, no votes. Uh, and secondly, this is the first time where the winner has won by less than a uh, 10% margin over oh, right, second so place. It, there's normally a bit of a runaway winner, but this time yeah, it's, uh, it's a not bit at all. So who who would be your guess if you had to guess? Out of, so just to remind you, because it's a couple of weeks ago. Well, now, so let's six, go through the five. The six tag team wrestlers oh, we put up. Yeah, we put the six up, didn't we? Um, I'll put it in alphabetical order. We've got Arn Anderson, Cesaro, Edge. Kane, Kofi Kingston, and Terry Gordy with a six. So, which out of those six, which one, which one do you would you like to win, and which one do you think will win? They may or may not be the same. Well, if you recall, those of you that are 
tuned in a couple of weeks ago, Paul and I had a little bit of a, a cat fight about whether or not the last person in the five would be Kofi Kingston or Arn Anderson. And in the end, uh, we came to an impasse and we stuck both of them on. So this was the unprecedented first time that we have six choices rather than five. Yep. Um, I think I think part of me would want Terry Gordy to win because it's a... I just think he was so outstanding in what he did, but I realistically don't think enough people would uh, would go for him. I think prob- I think I think I would say I think I would vote for Cesaro, timely because since the, uh, the we recorded that podcast, he's become tag team champion. Yeah, uh, indeed. Uh, I would vote for Cesaro, and I think he will be one of the two up the top, along with Edge. That would be my guess. Would be Edge and Cesaro are the one and two in some order. Hey. My vote would be Cesaro. Okay, well, starting from the bottom, I'm going to give approximate numbers on the percentages rather than accurate numbers. Um, but last place, um, with about 4% of the vote, Kane. Um, in fifth, with about 6%, Kofi Kingston. Okay. Uh, in fourth, with about 8%, is Edge. In fourth okay. position, yeah, lower than I would have thought too. In third position, with about nine percent of the vote, is Cesaro, who would have been my pick. Okay, there's some old school voting going on. There really, really is. So second, with thirty five point four two percent. I'll be accurate on these last two. Thirty five point four two percent of the vote, Arn Anderson. Which means two things. It means you were right on your pick for man number five. And it also means that our winner with 37.5%, Terry Gordy. That is wonderful. You are the best audience ever. <laughs> I, I love you like that. all of you. Well, I love at least 37% of you. The, the other 63% or so, I, I like you strongly. Um, but how cool is that? Terry Gordy wins a vote in 2020. I am so happy. We, I want a story on the website about that. I want it tweeted. I want it Facebooked. I want the world to know that Hooked On Wrestling fans know their stuff. They know to listen to me. They know to go back in the history. Ah, oh, I am so happy. Do you know what's fun, actually? If, if people haven't, if people have just listened to the podcast last time and then come to this one, you'll know that Paul and I had a right ding-dong about Kofi and on. I went straight to my Twitter after that, before we'd even put the um, the, the podcast out there and said, right, no context, settle this. Who is better as a tag team wrestler, Kofi or Arn? Because I was fairly certain the world would go, well, it's Arn Anderson. And on my vote, which I think had about 120 votes on Twitter, um, Kofi absolutely, I'll say it, Kofi pissed it. On, so on my, my very short one-hour poll on Twitter at about 11 o'clock on a Wednesday a couple of weeks ago, it was like Scientific. 70% Kofi, 30% Arn. So very interesting. That was just of those two. They didn't have the whole six to choose from, but... Um, I, so I'd given up all hope of Arn pushing for the top. I thought he he would get a beat by Kofi at least. Wow! Nope. So it's so one Gordy, two Anderson, three was it three? No, three Cesaro, Cesaro four three Edge, Cesaro four Edge, Kofi, and then Kane. Wow! Indeed. I love that. I love I love the unpredictability, and you know we're getting more votes than we were in these the, the earlier polls as well. Aren't oh, we? absolutely! The, vote, yeah. the, vote, the voting's going up so. It's not like nine people voted, and you know, if four of them pick Gordy, then he wins. You know, this is a fair, you know, a fair dinkum amount, amount of people. So, uh, well done, everybody. Uh, I'm very proud of you all. Uh, let's see if my strong opinions can win the day this time. Do you know what? They won't because I don't have lots of strong opinions for this particular podcast, but I am very excited uh, to talk about it. Just before I do, a quick mention for anyone that is joining us for the first time or for an early time. Uh, Paul and I are from Hooked On Wrestling, as it says up in the top corner, as it says on the mug that he's sipping from. Good timing, Mr. B. Uh, Hookedonwrestling.co.uk. We really, really love you to check out our website. That's where you can vote on the poll, but it's also where you can get all sorts of uh, goodies. I'll give you a little quick window, Paul, to do some plugging before we get into our uh, the meat of the pod. Yeah, well, um, as Rob said, we've got hookedonwrestling.co.uk, which is... The new home for news and features uh, in wrestling. We keep that updated on a regular basis throughout the day. We're breaking news. We've got some really interesting features, reviews, columns, even a bit of poetry on there, a bit of wrestling poetry, which is a bit 
a bit crazy. Um, but please do check it out if you haven't already. We're really proud of it. Um, obviously, we're getting to the point now, and I won't labor on this, we're getting to the point now we're starting to look at bringing our live event back, which is hugely exciting. Um, we are going to miss SummerSlam, which is sad, but um, sensible at the same time. Um, and But we'll definitely, I can say now, we're definitely back before the end of the year. Unless, That's uh, pretty cool. Well, as long as... As long as Mr. COVID doesn't strike. Well, as long as everyone follows the rules and wears their masks and uh, and does yep. their job. Um, and and, and uh, what's, what we'll be told to do, keep alert, stay alert, everybody. Yeah. Uh, but do wear your masks and keep non-distancing and uh, do all the things that are necessary because we would very much like to be back before the end of the year. That's the plan. And again, for those of you that are new to us, there might be people that have joined us since the website has become a thing and don't know the other side of our business. Hooked on Wrestling, um, in its essence, uh, is a live events company. That is to say, uh, we host pay-per-view parties for the big pay-per-views. That is to say, the Rumble, WrestleMania and SummerSlam, with a few assorted others uh, during the year. That's usually our stock in trade. Yep. Um, and they are all over the country. There's shortly to be even more places because we've, uh, we've taken in one of our competitors recently. Um, so once we can get back to it, which we cannot wait to do, uh, we're going to be up and running in a big way. And for everybody who is stuck with us, because we had a lot of people buy WrestleMania tickets, uh, which obviously we couldn't fulfill because of what happened with Wrestle WrestleMania. Uh, and we put it out there to everyone that had bought a ticket that we could re refund or we could kind of hold it in situ and, and you can take it up at a future date. And overwhelmingly, people voted to say, well, not voted, but overwhelmingly people let us give them a Indeed. bit of credit, as it were. Um, if anyone took the... Um, uh, you know, took their money back. We don't blame you at all. That's that was that's, that's perfectly cool as well. It's your own, it's your own call. But thank you for so many of you for for sticking with us because it's allowed us to be in a position uh, to go again. Had we have to give everything back, hooked on wrestling wouldn't be here right now. So uh, we cannot wait to be back in business, and that will be happening soon. The best place to follow all the details for that is on our social media because we did put out a uh, uh, a big update on that earlier this week. Uh, Paul, what's our social media um, channels? We've got Hooked on Wrestling on Facebook, which is facebook.com forward slash Hooked on Wrestling. Um, YouTube, the same, Hooked on Wrestling there. Um, on Twitter, it's HO underscore wrestling. And at Instagram, it's Hooked on Wrestling. So um, we've got all the four channels. YouTube's very much in its infancy, but we, we are regular updates on the rest. If you want to keep abreast of all the real key info, Facebook's the one to follow. Stick us a follow on there. Join the gang. We've got, you know, it's overwhelming how many followers we've got on now. You know, we, you know, we've got over 10,000 followers on Facebook now, Rob. I know Nuts. that's not an enormous amount in the grand scheme of things, but considering how slowly and organically we've built, you know, these are just people that have come to our events rather than any massive media or YouTube or influencer empire. We've got 10,000 followers on Facebook. Incredible. Really proud of that. Um, and loads of people that engage with us every day. So, um, yeah, thank you again. If, you, if, that, if you're one of those people that joins in, we really, really appreciate it. So, um, yeah, let's let's talk some submissions, shall we, Rob? Let's do that because if we hadn't have had, if we'd have had to give all that money back, and if WrestleMania would have really have hit us, we would have had to have submitted, and we would be finished. And what go. we're talking about today, <laughs> that was been labelled. <laughs> um, what we are talking about today is submission finishes. Uh, yeah. Very specifically. The moves which are synonymous with certain wrestlers that are submission holds and that are commonly those that end a match. You all know what we mean by that. We are talking about the greatest submission finishers in history, not just today, not just way back, all sorts of different eras. We will compare them all. Excuse me. But what is important to say is that it's the combo. So we are not putting in an armbar, for example. It would have to be someone's armbar. We're not going to put in a bear hug. <laughs> Has anyone ever finished a match with a bear hug since the mid-70s? No, no, we are not. Um, but, you know, we are not just putting in the bear hug. We would be putting in someone's specifics. Bear hug. We're not going to put in the bear hug. Um, <laughs> but we are going to go through our extensive uh, wrestling mental Rolodexes and come up with our favourite um, submission finishers. Paul and I will wrestle through the uh, our suggestions. We will come up with the top five. It might be easy. It might be a nightmare like it was last time. But we right. will come up with the top five for you, and then you'll be able to vote. Can I start this week? I'd like to offer one to begin with. You you feel free. I have got dozens on my list today, mate. So it's cool. the, by, by a long way the biggest list I've ever put together. So fill your boots. Let's get cracking. Uh, okay, straight in. Randy Orton's chin lock. Podcast ended. 
<laughs> Good night, everyone. No, go on. This is the moment. Oh, no, okay. We probably, yeah, we probably, should, do, we probably yeah. should do a bit more than that. No, that yeah. was the one I wanted to start with, just to, uh, to just mess about. But it is my, my point. I, there is a real point to saying that, is that there'll be lots of moves that we've seen people use over the years, but rarely end a match with. That's obviously a bit f one for comic effect. Okay. But there are, plenty of wrestlers, there are plenty of wrestlers that use a submission move as a move in their matches that so, they actually win a match with. We are talking going... about ones that as soon as you see that move, you know it. it's it's the submission equivalent of an RKO. So let in that case, why don't we start with a really interesting move? One that is unquestionably an iconic signature move, but also one that very, 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 very rarely finishes a match. Ric Flair's figure four leg lock. Well, yeah, I mean, that's true. I mean, it doesn't finish a match often uh, these days, or it hasn't done in the sort of latter part of Rick's career. I think there's a fair, fair shout that earlier on in his career, it, would, uh, it was used a bit more as a, as a finisher. But yeah, that's true, actually. If we're talking about an exception that proves the rule, yeah. you're probably right. When is the last time you saw anyone win with a figure four? Not just Flair, actually, but pretty much anybody that's used a figure four, you didn't often see them win with it. I mean, you're talking, how many people would you say they've, have used it solidly as a, as a move? I can think of another four or five. I'm thinking um, Greg Valentine, Jeff Jarrett. Yeah. Do you, do you count Buddy Landell? Um, mm. You know, a few other people that have used it as a, as a, as a move. Obviously they, they tried it with the Miz for a little while. Yeah. Um, I'm leaving off another member of Rick's family for the time being. Um, but it's one of those ones, that, and but Brett would often use it as a sort of a, not a transition move, but as a, 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 a move earlier in the match, wouldn't he? If he was wrestling yeah. a diesel or a taker, Bret Hart would use the figure four loads of times, but he never won a match with it. It was just a, it was a grind down move. It's a good point you make about Rick though. Yeah, I think, you know, it is the exception that proves a rule. I'm, I wanted to get it out of the way early because it's something that people have mentioned to us uh, when we ask for contributions. It's an iconic move. Um, but certainly not one I consider for the top five, just because of how rare it is that it actually finishes a match. I think the last time I, and I'm, I will be wrong on this, I know I'll be wrong on this, but the last time I remember it finishing a match was when he beat Randy Savage for the title in um, late 1992. And even that was some odd pin where he knocked him out rather than actually made him gave up. Yeah, that's uh, that's also true. Um, and I suppose this is a good point to have a discussion about how we are... Um categorizing these sorts of things because how much does a, a move have to be effective as in terms of what we see now we're not going to get into folks discussions on the technicalities of these moves about whether a person uses their left leg first or their right leg first or get into how john cena doesn't you know shows too much daylight when he's got an stf yeah. compared to say william regal we're not going to get into those kind of things we could but we're not qualified we're not wrestlers Paul and I have not done any wrestling. We've not done any anything that could be considered. I don't believe you've done any martial arts. Have you? you might have done a bit of karate when you were nine. Or I, I have no, not. No, neither have I. So um, we do not have a background. It's not. It, we can talk about what we think are great angles. We can talk about promos. We can talk about theme music, so all that kind of stuff. But for us to talk about the technicalities of a hold, not our job. We can, however, talk about how iconic they are, how effective they seemed, and what's most important, the reaction that they gain from the crowd, because that is everything as far as wrestling is concerned, or at least it will be when crowds are back in arenas. So to that end, Paul, I agree with you in terms of the, the flair figure four. We're talking finisher here. Yep. It is, it is iconic, but is it great? Let's move it on a step. The figure eight that mm. Charlotte uses is tremendous. She has taken I an existing agree. move. She's got a twist on it. Nobody else does it her way. And when she does it, you know what it's about. You know that expectation. I would link it. We'll come back to this one much later. But I would link it, her version of it a little bit to Kurt Angle's ankle lock. Yeah. Which is okay. the sense that Kurt has an, an Kurt has an ankle lock. And then but he then has, he has the a second down, level. And he does the grapevine of it. And it's kind of like once he does that, oh, they're not getting out of that one. And she has a similar sort of thing. Charlotte has the figure four. Then she bridges. And quite and often... That. She, she wins with that. The crowd, no. Take out your prejudices, folks, about Charlotte. I know people are getting into John Cena, Roman Reigns territory with Charlotte. Oh, she wins all the time. And I'm not saying you're right or wrong, but we were talking about the, the efficacy of the move. And I think everybody knows what's happening 
when the figure eight gets put on. Yeah, I fully agree. And Rob, by the way, what I'd like to do with this pod, uh, this podcast is slightly different to our usual format. I think what we should do is we should go, we should rattle through these moves, put them either in on the shortlist or not, and then really go into the fine discussion on the on the oh, few that we've idea. got left to, to to put on the five. We've got so many. I just feel like we could we could sort of lose people's interest, frankly, if we put too much. So let's let let's say let's say Charlotte's figure eight is definitely on that list to discuss further. Um, it's almost it's almost a process of elimination because there's just such a vast amount of great submission moves to go through. Um, okay, let's let's peg that for further consideration later on, shall we? So I'll put a little circle around that one. And are we are we saying that uh, that Rix does not go on? I think we are. That is controversial out of the gate. When we did the Undertaker's best ever matches outside of WrestleMania. We didn't include the Hell in the Cell with Mick Foley on our five. When we were doing the greatest ever King of the Ring, we only just put Stone Cold Steve Austin onto the top five. This is a podcast that thinks, folks. We love Stone Cold Steve Austin's 316 speech, and we understand the significance. I won't say we love the move, but we understand the significance of Taker and Mick Foley. But we look into a little bit more depth about it, and we're going to say early on, in the category that we're saying... Ric Flair's figure four, not on the five. Uh, that will make, uh, let me see, Owen, where is it? Owen Fothergill, very happy, because Owen Fothergill on Twitter, uh, Facebook said to us, Ric Flair's figure four wins, and if it doesn't, I'm sorry to say you're wrong and a bad person. Well, thank you very much, Owen. I'll take that every day of the week. I mean, we're not wrong, we're right. The fact that we are bad people is a coincidence. Yeah, that's true. That's absolutely that's true. That's just the way it- that's just the way it goes. Okay, then let's. You can lead this week. Then, if, we, if you've come up with the the long list and you've come up with a very fair way of doing it, I think, which is to to rattle through. And also, you can hear that my voice is going. <clears throat> so, um, you can uh, lead us off. So, you give us a, give us a couple more. Okay, Oak. Um, I'm just trying to think of some that um, might not make the absolute final reckoning. I don't want to shoot our bolt too early. So, what I'm gonna, I tell you where I'm going to go was let's stick with women for the time being. What I was really pleasantly surprised about when I put my long list together is just how many women feature on it. And I suppose the conclusion I drew was because, um, you know, not to put too fine a point on it, there's not many women in the sport that can do those power moves. Most of them are more about finesse style technique so a finisher like a submission works really well in women's wrestling because um because it fits the mold you know you think of all the top women stars that have got um that have got submission moves obviously you've got charlotte that we've discussed we've got Paige, we've got aj lee some of these we might come back to in a little while we've got becky lynch exactly um but one i want to talk about above all and in terms of legitimate legitimacy i don't think anything on this list could possibly beat it Ronda Rousey's armbar. Well, it's a great shout. Um, it really is. I guess that was where you were going to go. And again, I'm just trying to get our comments here because I know a few people uh, did bring that up. Um, let me see. Yeah, Andy Keenan is one that jumps out. Ronda's armbar. Everyone taps out as soon as it is locked in. Uh, yeah, is what he said. And I'll, I'll just keep that as just a one mention. But I know that several people did mention well, let- uh, Ronda's armbar. Legitimacy. I think that's the key. Let me explain my love for the armbar. It's not just, obviously, the legitimacy plays a massive part in it. You know, her USC background was built on the armbar, which makes the move instantly more credible than, or as credible, should I say, as any move in wrestling history. Um, What I really like about it, though, is that it's, or one of the things I really like about it, should I say, is that second stage. You touched on it with Charlotte Flair and Kurt Angle. It's so theatric for a woman that came from a pure combat sports background. It could have just been so dry and boring. But when she goes for that arm bar, do you remember back to her debut when she had it on Stephanie McMahon or Triple H? I forget which one, but at WrestleMania, she got the arm bar in and then she kind of looked to the crowd and they were struggling. They were struggling. And then as soon as she cinched it all the way in, dropped back, A, it gave the crowd a chance to pop and B, you knew that was game over. That was the moment they went from a dangerous move to right. That's it done ring the bell and i love submission moves like that i love submission moves that have got that you know like um you know like when uh i'm trying to think of another one like benoit would roll over on the cross face and get it back in the center of the ring and things like that um but i love this and i really i would make i would want to make a strong case for for carrying this one forward to our final list are you are you keeping the track of these i am indeed you can trust me on this i'll I'll be secretary this week 
I agree. It goes from the long list to the short list, or the, me- the medium. It goes from the long list to the medium list before we get to the short list. Let's come back to your uh, females approach because I think it's a good approach. But before we do that, let me stay in MMA briefly. Yeah. Because I think I want to. I want to know if the Kimura, as used by Brock Lesnar, qualifies because hmm. they sort of abandoned it. He didn't use it the first time round, to my recollection. It was something he did when they came yeah. back. Having been UFC champion, they wanted to bring in this UFC mixed martial arts stuff into the into Brock Lesnar's routine, and then they kind of abandoned it, you know, after a well, short while. But it was the same thing of what you're saying. It was the two two um, twofold thing. It was the Kimura. It was the move, and then he would go, and it was the arm break, wasn't it? Yes, there was the second was. stage of it, which was the the you know the gimmick in that someone had broken their arm. So that, to me, is a very similar thing to uh, Ronda. However, I kind of feel like it's been a bit forgotten. So do we include it because it's only been a part of Brock's career? It's an interesting question. Uh, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sound really contrary here, actually. But when Brock came back from his USC stint, obviously they really leaned into that aspect of his character at first, didn't they? For the first, what, two, years, two years, I guess? Yeah. Two or three years. Um and I suppose the change, well, I don't suppose the change happened when he discovered the suplex city um, sort of variant. As soon as that, you know, that was a shortcut to him having to do far less work and get far, far more over. Um, so good for him, first of all. Um, but that's when he became suplex city Brock Lesnar rather than UFC Brock Lesnar. It changed his whole approach. Um, I'm going to say, all right, get this. This is, this would be the most contradictory and contrary. I'm going to sound all day long. I don't want to include um, the Kimura for pretty much for the reasons you've said it was it's kind of forgotten um, it did it came in a period of Brock Lesnar's career remember when he was in that that sort of period between coming back and beating Taker he was almost on his arse you know he lost to Triple H he lost to John Cena he beat CM Punk admittedly but until he beat Taker um, at Wrestlemania he was just another face in the crowd at that point you know really there was no real excitement over him facing uh, facing undertaker at wrestlemania he was just another body for the streak every single bit of rehabilitation he had came after that where the kimura is not part of his arsenal now having said all that one thing one name i did have on the list with absolutely zero expectations of it going on to the long uh, to the short list by the way but i did want to talk about it do you remember the brock lock no i really oh, don't mate. And, I, and i knew you were going to say that because when we were texting about this earlier on setting this up you used the phrase Brock Lock, and I thought, I don't know what that means. He used it, and this is why I'm sounding contradictory. He used the Brock Lock for no more than a month, probably, in around 2003. And it was when he was feuding, sort of well, quasi-feuding with Chris Benoit, and they wanted, you know, they were going in, leaning into the submission style, and Brock didn't have a submission. He came up with this Brock Lock. Now, if you've not seen it, and anybody out there has not seen it, do type it into YouTube. There's a few good examples in there. And it, it by the way, I'm just mentioning it for the sake of mention. I will be crossing off the list, but it just looks awful and fierce. So you imagine Brock Lesnar, right? Okay. Now, when you say awful, you mean it looks like it hurts. You don't mean it looks badly executed. Correct. It looks Sorry, hurts, yeah. it looks awful if you're in it. You've got Brock Lesnar, and what he does is he kind of puts one of his opponent's leg, legs over the back of his head and neck, you know, as if he was oh, carrying I a backpack. I do remember that. Yeah. I and do then he'd remember le- that. And then, he'd, and then he'd lean their face into the, into the ground and stretch back almost like a, like, know, a scorpion. like a supercharged, like a scorpion, like a Walls of Jericho, but on absolute, you know, on, on bloody acid. And, yeah. He, he, you know, it is not in consideration. I say it again, but oh my god, I wish he kept using that move because it looked fucking brutal. I remember seeing it for the first time when he applied it and just going, "Oh my god!" And it was honestly, if it had carried on, I think it would have been. If he'd have carried on using it, it would have gone down as one of the greatest submission moves of all time, if booked right. But it just came and went away. He never used it. Interesting. So. Um, it's a good it's a good ch- chance for me to mention a couple of moves again, which aren't going to go anywhere. But and I don't I don't think they even have names. But again, things that happen short term never seem to get over. They never seem to push it for whatever reason. Do you remember Edge doing a sort of weird twisted version of the sharpshooter? Yes. Yeah. Well, he would do sort of do the sharpshooter and then turn a little bit similar. Do you remember Bull Nakano used to do a move like that? 
Uh, hers, was a bit, uh, hers was a little bit more like serious where she'd sort of do it and then twist around. But Ed sort of did that for a little while. And Shawn Michaels had a sort of an inverted figure four. Remember that? Where he sort of crossed the legs oh, over and he put his leg on the top and, and pushed it down. It, oh, looked sir, do. one of the most, it looked like one of the most devastating moves I've ever seen. It, it was never a finisher. It doesn't go into this chat. You never want a match with it, I don't think. But I don't remember that. It looked, it looked like, it, rather than doing the sort of spin on the figure four, he would sort of just, in, it's his legs were underneath rather than over the top. But it, oh, man, it live, it looked, looked good. But similar to the Brock Lock thing, it was just short term thing and, and they never really went with it. It was never, Sean's never really used a, uh, a submission as really part By the of way, arsenal. that edge move was the educator. Oh, was it? Okay. He, he did oh, have that move, yeah. You have educated me. I didn't know that. There you go. There you go. Look, I just want to run through a couple more that I don't That's think it. deserve consideration. But I, but I, you know, some of my uh, my personal favourites. One I always used to love back in the day. If I told you the stump puller. Oh, that's the one I was going to mention. <laughs> what a I move. can't believe you said it. But just before we went on air, I said to Paul, "I've got a really good one. I want to talk." Is that about the one? It. That was the one I was talking about. I can't believe you've said that. I thought I was being such a bloody clever, smart-ass, <laughs> wise guy <laughs> coming up with Doink's stump puller. <sighs> what a move. I mean, I, I don't know. I, I associate it with Doink. They yes. might well, I, I assume other people will have used it in the in the history. They mentioned it on commentary only a couple of weeks ago. I forget who well, said did it. They? Did think, they? Right, I okay. Think, I, think, I think Samoa Joe said it in the pay-per-view last oh, week. That would, week that, would, that would compute. I yeah, th- right. I think Joe used, I forget what move, but I think Joe said something like, oh, this is a bit like a version of a stunt puller. I just um, love it when moves fit the character. And, you know, Doink's original heel character was so, so good. That sadistic, mean, twisted, nasty bully. And that move had, had no finesse to it whatsoever. He just got on the back of his opponent, seated, pressed their neck forward and yanked his leg back. And I can just feel how painful that is. Unless you're a yoga expert, that move is is, is causing you all sorts of damage if it was real life. And it just looked and it just looked the way he applied it just looked so raw and dirty and awful and I loved it. Absolutely loved it. Reason number one hundred and thirty seven why heel doink was better than babyface doink. Heel doink, stump puller, babyface doink, whoopee cushion with a there you go. fart noise. There you go. They're almost two oh, separate characters, mate. Doink well, the they're, clown, they're, they're two different people, so... Doink the Clown as a heel was one of the greatest heel gimmicks of all time. Not one of the greatest heels, I might stress, but one of the greatest heel gimmicks of all time, bar very few. Um, Doink the Clown as a baby face was to pander to the children, and which is fine. I am I, gonna, you know, it's got its place. I'm going to nose this up because you know that I know nothing about films. But mm. is it like... Um, the heel doink is Christian Bale's Batman and the baby face doink is George Clooney's Batman. <laughs> Kinda, but more okay. pertinently, I... more, more pertinently, heel doink is Heath Ledger's Joker and um, baby face doink is um, Jim Carrey's Riddler or see uh, what's his name? I can't remember the name you of the guy the, who played Joker in the sixties. All right, Joker, Joker in the sixty series. Is it Caesar Benini? Caesar Benini was that his name? How am I going to know that? I'm not going to know. I that, don't know, I? but somebody out there will. Somebody out there um, will know more than me. But I think it was. Let me just. I'm going to Google. Yeah, <laughs> I know three people that have played the Joker: um, Heath Ledger, Joaquin Phoenix, and Sting. That's the three <laughs> people I know that have played the Joker. <laughs> Well, Doink, Doink the Clown the Heel gimmick was Heath Ledger's joke. Oh, see, Cesar Romero. Cesar Romero, of course oh, you, it was. You Cesar were, Romero. You were close. Rock, rock, Rocky's brother. There you go. There you go. There you go. Um, so, yeah, Stump Puller. We can't put it forward, can we? As much no, as we, we both love no. it, we can't put it forward. Um, and in that same... Well, there's a few of them. Do, 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 we want, do we want to rattle through... through... Yeah, yeah, we do, we do, so we absolutely do. Yeah. Similar. yeah, go on then. Because I, I would say, as uh, Wayne Goodyear mentions on our Facebook um, page, and a couple of other people said it as well, he said Perry Saturn's Rings of Saturn. Great move. Very yeah. similar thing. Um, great move, looks great, but no one ever went, oh, oh my God, it's the Rings of Saturn. It just didn't. Nope. 
Perry no. wasn't pushed like that. That wasn't his character. You just you just can't put him on that same level. Agreed. Uh, a few um, others that are a bit like that. What about the um, Lex Luger torture rack? The torture rack, I'd say the same sort of thing. Um, probably a step above because it obviously did finish a lot of matches. But I never really liked the torture rack because it didn't look like it hurt all that much. It didn't, did it? It looked like a nice little piggyback. Yeah, nice I, little think, piggyback. I, think, I think if you had a guy like Brock Lesnar doing it or a guy who was more vicious than Lex Luger, then it could have looked fantastic. Somebody could bring the torch rack right now and it could look great. But the way Lex Luger did it, he just bounced them around on his shoulders and he never really wrenched it because he wasn't that sort of wrestler. So I don't, the torch rack never did it for me. The other one I'd put in the same sort of vein, um, you mentioned him earlier, Samoa Joe and his Kakina clutch. Well, okay. I, I, I'd like to go in a little bit more depth about that topic, if I may. So can we, can we just put that on hold a wee bit? Yeah, we'll come yeah, back sure. To the kick- we'll come back to Joe. Go for it. Um, okay, but a, f- a few others that I've got in the, in a similar sort of vein. Um, the regal stretch, perfectly yep. applied, looked fantastic. But quite frankly, Regal was never on a level enough. Listen, we love William Regal, and we have every respect for him. One of the greatest pure wrestlers you'll ever see. But the William Regal as a wrestler and the Regal stretch as a finisher was never on that level. Never on the level no. that we're going to get to with a few of our moves uh, that are still to come. Uh, and I would also say a similar thing for maybe the last chancery of Austin Aries. Uh, I didn't even have that on the list, to be honest. But yeah, I'd say I'd say you're right on that. Looks amazing. Looks absolutely amazing. Looks like it hurts to hell. Yeah. But, and I like Austin Aries as a wrestler, but has he ever really been of that level where people would, you know, revere the move? No, not that's really. Not his fault necessarily, and it's not the move's fault. But I just don't think anyone's going to immediately come to that. Fair enough. Yeah. No, I think I think that's fair enough. Um, yeah, I can't I can't argue that at all. Let's do a few more that you were saying about the, uh, the the female side of things. You were talking about there being a lot of females on your list. Because I yeah. think several of them are going to be credible. Like, for example, I've got a Becky Lynch shirt on, right? I've got the man Becky Lynch shirt on. And Becky's um, disarmor is yeah. really over. Becky really over. Move really over. Probably to go on our medium list. I don't um, think it's going to end up in the five. But you can't deny that she's been massively over. Yeah, I would agree. Deny that the, the move is what's what's her other finisher? She doesn't well, have another one. It's um, am I right in thinking it won her the world the title in the main event at WrestleMania? Therefore, it has to go on lists, doesn't it? Do you know what yeah. I mean? It's like, but it's a it is a it is a variant, is it not, of the Fujiwara armbar? Really? Uh, yes, of course it is. Yeah. And if we were talking about just submission moves. Fujiwara Armbar would walk onto this list. It's a devastating looking hog. Timothy Thatcher does a bit of a version of it, doesn't he? And he, he, does, he, yeah. he, 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 he looks very credible. Um, but I think this one of those, um, for a little bit, Bobby Roode used it as a finisher in, in TNA. But I think it's one of those ones that a lot of people use it, but I don't know how many people have used it to such a, a devastating effect. I think she's the best of them. I feel like there's going to be some, we're going to end up talking about the moves, who does the moves and who is the most associated with it for them to move forward, if you, if you know what I mean. I would say of all the people who have done, of even any version of an arm bar, really, because you could argue about Del Rio's, I don't know what you would call that one, but the one where Del Rio would flip Just a cross, ar- back cross arm it. breaker, the wasn't cro- it? The cross arm breaker. I would, say, I would put the disarmer ahead of his move, for example. Uh, yeah, 100%. It did, she did a lot more. Just to clarify, by the way, she didn't win the main event at WrestleMania with it. It was by pinfall. But um, I think it doesn't really take away from my point too much. I think it, it was a, it's an iconic move in a historic uh, history-making wrestler. Um, and it was a key part of her arsenal. So I think it absolutely goes on that on that next level of consideration. Do you agree? Oh, yeah. I'm not convinced it'll make the five, but I think it deserves, it deserves its, its step up. Yes, yes, agreed, agreed. Who else, who else have you got? You said there was a few. Who else you got? There is a few. So I've got AJ Lee's Black Widow. Now, okay. Th- this again, one, I, I, this, I... this one's a sleeper. Okay. So again, you know, this, this is a woman. You don't, that... you don't mean, you don't mean a sleeper like the move. You mean a sleeper as in one of those Sorry. ones that you. 
a sleep a sleeper hit yeah thanks for yeah. correct thanks for confirming that yeah so the, if anyone remembers the black widow it was such an innovative looking move i don't recall anybody else doing anything similar um it could be applied well, from anywhere is it not is it not just an octopus stretch is it not like the octopus that yeah, Jim it's a do? bit but it, it yes and no the octopus stretch is a bit you know he was doing it a little bit more sort of a transition move this was more like RKO style where it could be applied from anywhere, wasn't it? It was, you know, she could weasel away onto it from anywhere. It was more of a, a murder death kill move. And it, you know, she won a lot of matches with that in that longest women's title reign um, that she enjoyed. Again, I'm not going to argue massively hard for it to go on the long, on the, on the next level, but it was a, I thought it was a really, really good move. I tell you why I don't like it so much is because I sort of feel it's one of those moves. You just say it's a bit like an RKO. I don't think it is. I think it's one of those ones where it has to be manipulated. It has to be. I tell you what it's most like. Do you know when Cena does that comeback? Right. And he, and he ducks a, you know, he'll do the off the, off the rope shoulder block. The guy gets up off the rope shoulder block. And then yeah, the yeah. guy always, always throws a right hand, which Cena ducks and then turns it into the spinning suplex. Yeah? Yes, I know what you mean. Yeah. Well, that sequence relies on his opponent always throwing a right hand. Yes. And they always, always throw a right hand. And I think if your six-year-old son watched every John Cena match, because he's a bright lad, he'd go, why don't they just kick him in the stomach, Dad, rather than throwing a right hand? And I think in the past, uh, people, like, people like CM Punk have done so, people that have got a brain, is that when Cena's in the midst comeback, they go, well, I'm not going to do that. You know, Roddy Piper would just poke him in the eye. And I hate the fact that someone else has to do a move for Cena to get into it. And I would argue for AJ Lee to get that move on, they pretty much always had to try and do a side suplex or a, you know, a, a similar sort of twisting backbreaker or something. And then she had to go into the head scissors to, you know, to then lock it on. Fair I, enough. Thought it, I thought it looked a little bit concocted to get okay. to that. I, I agreed that it was over and I agreed it was her finisher. Um, I would argue that Tajiri did it slightly better, although his wasn't a finisher. And I just think it was a little bit crafted. That's why I would be against it. Fine. Right. Okay. Let's get it off. Two more um, female led moves. Uh, one that I just want to give a very quick mention to, to Paige's PTO. Good move. Remind Used me. very briefly. Uh, PTO was uh, kind of a, how do I describe this? Kind of a modified bow and arrow, a modified standing bow and arrow. Oh yeah, I did. I like yeah, that. Yeah. I did. I did like that. Not was good. to the top of the list, but yeah. yeah but worth a mention. And but the one that I do think needs to be at least discussed, the bank statement. Well, it's it it, it does need to be discussed, um, because it needs to be discussed in association with a few other moves. Okay. Um, I like the bank statement a lot, uh, and. Again, it falls into our two move bracket, doesn't it? It's a it, she does something, yep, and then transitions into it. How similar is it to a cross face? Very similar. Very similar so indeed. What you then have to do is discuss everyone that's done a cross face and discuss whether she's the best at it. Fair point. Let's I mean, do I'm that then, shall we? I, I'm not saying I'm not saying it's wrong or right. And I'm also saying, by the way, folks, let's address this face on. We are allowed to talk about Chris Benoit on this podcast. If we want to put him on the top five, we will. If he wins a vote, he wins it. We do not justify anything that Chris Benoit has ever done. Of course, it was appalling. We do not believe he should be in the Hall of Fame, etc., etc. But he is fair game to be talking about things that happened in wrestling history. Therefore, we are not airbrushing. Chris Benoit is in this top, is in this conversation, and I would argue that Chris Benoit's crossface is better and more over than the bank statement. But I love the bank statement. The secondary thing is, is th there's no rule to say that we can't put both of them in the list. No, absolutely. And I agree with you. I think Benoit's crossface is the, the most talked about, the most well-remembered, the most iconic crossface, uh, for better or worse. Um, and I think you're right. If, if I was ranking the two, Benoit's would come ahead. So... Isn't it interesting how no one did the crossface for years because mm. of the association with Benoit? Yeah, and the absolutely. First person, the first person I remember start to start doing it was Triple H. Yeah. Because I can do what I want because I'm Triple H. Then Sean oh. started to do it because he's Sean. And then 
Everybody does. <laughs> There's loads of versions. I, I Again, don't necessarily agree. You know, we don't know the full story there. Maybe, maybe there was some hesitation to do the crossface and Triple H right, doing rightly. it was an, in, in, an indicator, absolutely rightly. And Triple H doing it was more a message to the wrestling world that it was okay now to do, that enough time had passed. And, you know, if the boss, you know, if the boss is, boss but the boss's son or the ceo or whatever you want to call him <laughs> sorry sorry is... just to clarify i'm not doing the sleeper thing again but when you say the boss you mean the manager oh, God, the boss, yeah. as opposed to <laughs> the banks i do i do all right let's say if, if if the coo of wwe is applying the move then obviously that's an endorsement from management that it's okay to bring that back into your arsenal so i would you know i'd given the benefit of the doubt on that one as a as an unsaid endorsement that enough time had passed to bring that move um, back um well let's should we stick both of them on the list for now for a bit of further discussion later what about the label lock uh the label lock or the yes lock Same thing. um yeah i would put that maybe a level below yeah I would honestly say. um it was always you know it was a great it's a great finisher but it was never his primary finisher i would argue yes, it was I no 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 it definitely was. It definitely was in WWE for a time. However, he, he then went to that running knee thing, which I don't know whether if, that, if that's got a proper name. But the the, the belt, the, the belt was definitely his. No, sorry, it. it was for but, but I would also argue, I would also argue that the cattle mutilation that he used in Ring of Honor was a better finisher. You took the words out of my mouth. Yeah, I'd say it wasn't even his best fin- submission move. Cattle mutilation is is on my list, and. The yes lock was too, but I think we're going to remove it because it just just was never, never as as important to the individual as the crossface, uh, the crippler crossface in the bank statement. Fair. Okay. The the bank statement also the name of an album by Tony Banks, a former member of Genesis. How uh, very in, which, how very interesting. Je- well, it is wrestling because obviously Genesis uh, was the name of a TNA pay per view, as indeed was Against All Odds, which was a song by Phil Collins. <laughs> Who was also in Genesis? <laughs> I can bring everything back if you need me to. God, they really need an invisible touch pay per view, don't they? And it, in fact, in fact, Triple H was a big fan of Genesis, wasn't he? Peter Gabriel, Sledgehammer. See, it all comes round. You can bring it all round if you need to. <laughs> oh dear me! That's why I love doing this podcast, mate. Mike M- Mike Rutherford was in Genesis. Mike and the mechanics he went on to do. Steve Austin always refers to himself as a great mechanic. See, I can bring it all round. It's not a problem. There you go. Any, there anyone you else? Go. No, no, I think we'll, we'll leave it there for the sake of for the sake of our listenership. I know, four, I know four members of Genesis, which I didn't know I knew. <laughs> right. Um, let's, well, cattle mutilation. Let's stick with that, shall we, now? I, I put this in the Kakina clutch bracket where it's a really good move, but it's not going to make, it's not realistic going to make our top five. So let's just jettison <sighs> it now. With the, with the greatest of respect to Ring of Honor, I just think that it's not, been used on a big enough scale. No, nope. you know he, he never really used it a couple of times in WWE. In fact, I remember a very early match of Daniel Bryan's where, um, I believe it was Matt Stryker on commentary going, "Yeah, great, go for the cattle mutilation," and I, I almost could sense someone in his ear going, "Stop it!" You know, I mean, I was like, stop being such, a, such an insider trying to get yourself over by by saying these things. And well, AJ um, Styles has used it more in WWE than Daniel Bryan has. Let's do that one then. Let's go to him. What about the uh, the calf killer? Um, calf crusher. Calf crusher. Again, I, I don't. I not got that on my list, and I just don't. I, it's a good submission move. It's a really good submission move. But can you name me five matches he's won with it? No. So let's move. I just on. Do, sometimes I'm I'm doing the Jeff Stelling speaking for the crowd. Yeah, of course. I ask the silly questions of, you know, Paul Merson and Phil Thompson because he knows that some people watching Soccer Saturday will do that. And so if I hadn't have mentioned the calf killer, then other people would have gone, why didn't you say the calf killer? Fair so, enough. Uh, cool. I had to say it. Um, let's do the sleeper then. All right, let's do it. Because you go, well, f- f- first of all, there's an argument to say that this, I don't want to do a long history lesson here, but there's an argument to say that the sleeper is the oldest wrestling move going. Um, the re- have you heard of Ed the Strangler Lewis? Yep. Well, Ed the Strangler Lewis is called Ed the Strangler Lewis because he used to strangle people with a sleeper. Oh, nice. Okay, lovely. And then, and then it was a move used by Jim Londis, who was the biggest star of the 1920s. 
whenever we get into that, who's the biggest star, Hogan or Austin or even Bruno, Jim Londres was the biggest star than all of them. But it happened, but it was 100 years ago, so it doesn't come into the conversation. But if you look at your wrestling history, the sleeper goes right the way back to when it was being, when it was still, I'm not saying it was, you know, a work. It was even, it was real before it became a work. But when it became a work, the sleeper was a recognized hold that looked like it could hurt yeah. you. And that's what the whole thing of needing a heel needing to break the rules where they can break the rules by choking as opposed to using a legit hold. So the sleeper is, you know, tale as old as time, as, uh, as the song once said. Um, but it's interesting how it's been developed. Everyone knows the sleeper now very much as a transition. Mm. But, you know, P- Piper used it as a finisher. Brutus Did. Beefcake used it as a finisher. And they were mega over. Yeah, great. It's a great effect. Absolutely. Um, um, I, don't, I don't think they're strong enough for our list. But I think it needs to be mentioned that Piper and Beefcake both had that move proper over as a regular sleeper. I think Piper could be lower end. Like, you know, I've got him on my long list, but wouldn't wouldn't want okay, to we'll push him, him forward any we can, further we can put him through if you wish i'm, I'm not anti it no, no 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 i mean I, I mean i wouldn't have him any further than we are but i think he's, he's worth mentioning um obviously there is one that stands above all else really when it comes to sleep holes isn't there okay the million dollar dream okay but well, that's the next then that's the next step but then is the million dollar dream better than the cobra clutch which is the same move hmm yeah, but it's the same thing, essentially, isn't it? Sarge's, Sarge's Cobra Clutch, you could argue, is, is, is just as over as the Million Dollar Dream. <sighs> it, it, it is exactly the same move. No, but is that our age, right? Because here's the thing I will say. when You know when Sarge would always come back in the sort of early 2000s, like yeah. once or twice a year, there'd be, who's this mystery opponent? And it would always be Sergeant Slaughter, right? Um, and he would use the Cobra Clutch, and they'd go, oh, it's the Cobra Clutch. And I'd always go... That's not the Cobra Clutch. That's the Million Dollar Dream. And even before that, you know, they would say, Sergeant Slaughter's move is the Cobra Clutch. And I'd go, no, it isn't. It's the Camel Clutch. Because the Sarge that I knew was evil Iraqi sympathizer Sarge. And to me, he used the Camel Clutch. Yeah. But that's actually a very, very small part of his career. For most of his career, his move was the, was the, was the Cobra Clutch as, a, as opposed to the, the Camel. So I would argue yeah. that move is both DBRC and Sarge, which kind of waters it down a little bit for me. I kind of feel less obliged to put it forward because I associate it with two different people. Interesting. I would I would never have thought, you know, Sergeant Slaughter for me is, like you say, it's probably our age, but it's more camel clutch for me. It's, when that's I, when only I look that at, one run. That's one hmm, run. I agree with you. I agree, but it obviously made a real strong impression yeah. um, in my head. But, the, um, but for me, the million dollar dream, if you told me name the best sleeper finisher ever, it's the million dollar dream and it's the million dollar man's million dollar dream, in my opinion. Nope. Go on. Go on. Have you got one better? Taz Mission, baby. Ooh, do you know what? I never put that in the same bracket, but you're absolutely right, aren't you? Absolutely Yukata right. Hajime, as Joey Styles would call it. I believe it's a judo hold. The Taz, the Taz Mission. And actually, um, Samoa Joe's so-called coquina clutch used to look a lot more like yeah, it did. the transmission. Now it looks more like a sleeper, or if you want to call it a rear naked choke, yeah. which is the, this is the martial arts wording for a sleeper. It's not quite the same thing. I don't believe again, don't at me folks. Cause I don't know those ins, ins and outs. I think naked in that respect refers to not having the gear on. Is that right? I think it's in, it's it's a it's a no move idea. that you apply without having the the, the karate or judo equipment. No idea. Uh, I'm making I'm I'm open, making an, a I'm opening a big bear trap here by saying all this. Um, but anyway, anyway, I certainly wouldn't have Joe's on it. I think Joe's looks a little bit like a big hug. But the Taz mission locked in, leaning back, legs hooked. That walks into the, the list as far as I'm concerned. I fully agree to the point where I'd rather just save the discussion on it till a bit later because I think it's an absolute shoe in um to move to move on so yeah fair enough i never associated those two moves as a, as a as having a similar sort of um origin but yeah no i agree i agree i think it looks devastating it's taking that move on to that next level and okay you could be hard i, I might sound harsh here because i said that the cattle mutilation in ring of honor was not used to a, a big enough audience you could say to me well, well ecw wasn't any bigger and, it, and, it, and he didn't really use it in, in WWE. He did use it in WWE to begin with his debut against Kurt and all that kind of stuff. 
It was part. Of, it was what Taz was. You beat um, Kurt Angle at one of the well, most well received pay per views of all time at Madison Square Garden with that move. So that's automatically in the conversation way more than anything ever happened in Ring of Honor. And ECW is so much more culturally significant over the years than Ring of Honor will ever be. And Taz is Taz is an interesting case study because let's be frank here, folks, and this is not a knock on the guy. Taz is not a great wrestler, right? Mm. There's lots of little people, little people, I don't mean that, shorter fellas, right? Daniel Bryan, various others that are, you know, five eight, five nine, five yeah. ten, considered smaller fellas Dima, in wrestling. Dima Lenko. Right, they are, and they are great wrestlers. Okay, Taz is not a great wrestler, but the Tasmaniac into Taz as a character and how it was put together in in ECW was amazing. And there's a reason why he always had short matches because Paul Heyman saying hide the negatives, you know, show the positives. Yep. And Taz was so over in ECW. And again, I am. That is, not, I, you could you could construe that. Some other dodgy news site could write that as a, you know, nickel slams Taz. But I absolutely mean that as a compliment. It's a crucial part of his character, not dissimilar to a Brock Lesnar. That's how, yeah. you know, Brock Lesnar might look like two Tazzes stood on each other's shoulders and a bit wider, but it's still just as important as having that move. And that's what the Taz mission is Taz, the way that the RKO is around the Orton. Agreed. You know, with, no, without, the Taz, without the Taz mission... Peter Sinertia is enhancement talent. Now that's your headline. But it's not a criticism. It's not a criticism. <laughs> it's not a criticism. No, I'm it's kidding. A, a, yeah. I'm joking. But no, you, you, you're absolutely right in everything you've said. Um, Taz Mission definitely moves forward. Do we move the million dollar dream forward or not? I'll leave it up to you. Let's, let's stick it in the long list. Okay. I think, we'll, I think we'll knock it off, but let's stick it in the long list. All right. Okay, cool. Where do you want to go now? Uh, let's do. I want to do a couple of older ones, which I, I don't necessarily. I don't think go. This is not my Terry Gordy, before everyone's uh, memory, but push it through thing. But there's two I want to mention because they're very historically significant. Um, I think wrestling has moved on to the extent where some of the older, mo- like for example, talk about Piper's Sleeper. It was very, very, very over. But the Taz mission just looks more devastating. As well as it yeah. being over in Taz's character, it looks like it hurts. If you look at the sleeper, really, you go, does that? Does it look like he's hugging his head or does it look like he's trying to rip his head off? Um, Terry Funk and Dory Funk had the spinning toe hold, which won them NWA world titles. Yeah. Um, it was amazingly over. The, the Funk spinning toe hold was legendary. Uh, and Fritz von Erich and therefore his sons had the claw. Yeah, and those moves yeah. were just and and in, so did Bar- and so did Baron von Raschke. Those moves were absolutely mega over. And if Fritz hit the claw, he'd won. And if Dory went on the spinning toe hold, you knew where it was going. I'm not putting those forward for for potential on the five. They might be on the longer list, but they won't make the five. They don't deserve to, quite frankly. But it really does need to be looked at the same way that I mentioned. You know, Ed the Stranglers and Jim Londers a little bit more. Um, to closer to, to the modern day, it absolutely needs mentioning the Von Eric Claw and the and the Funk spinning toe hold. But I, 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 I want to leave. I had the Von Eric Claw on there as well. Incredible move, incredibly over. Yeah, you know, ticks all our boxes. Just because you know you or I could apply that, um, you know, with with our arms, with one arm tied behind our back, doesn't make it any less an, an excellent example of a really good move. Um, so yeah, well well brought up there, mate. But, I'm really, really pleased you did. We haven't done. We haven't done Crush or the Great Carly with a <laughs> vice, vice. Shall we not? No, let's not. Shall we not? But, let's go with a big one now. Let's go with a big one. Give us, give us a headliner, mate. Okay, well, I'll take it. I'll take it on a step, right? Very, very similar to the claw. Let's do that. Mandible the, claw. Mm, the mandible claw, tasty. Okay, um, you go first. You go first on this one. I've got I've got a take on this, but it has to get through the qualifiers. Else. I think it has to get through the qualifiers into Agreed. the next round. This is this is the group stage of the World Cup. We might only be having the mandible claw up against you know, you know it, Iran and South Korea at this point, <laughs> but it's still going to get through uh, into the next round. It's maybe it, it might be a it might be a Belgium or it might be a Switzerland. I'm not sure, but it's going to get through the, the group stage. 
Um, mankind. Up until Mankind became a comedic figure. So the first two years of Foley before... Probably before the... Maybe the first year before the interview with Jim Ross. Yeah. He started to turn in babyface. The, the evil, twisted Mankind character is amazing. Absolutely amazing. Yeah. And that move epitomizes him because Mankind is not a wrestler. Actually, Mick is, a, Mick is a better wrestler than people realise, but the character of Mankind is not a wrestler. It's a fighter. It's a nasty piece of work. It's sadistic. It's a mutilator, as the story goes. But if he had, let's say, a figure four, it just wouldn't be right. If he had a transmission, it wouldn't be right. But the mandible claw, the idea that you press down on the nerve under the tongue, debilitating your opponent is so perfect for mankind. Doesn't the story go that I think Cornette might have given it to him? It comes from the uh, from Sam Shepard, who was the, the guy that the film The Fugitive was based on, that he was okay. Dr. Sam Shepard. This is in mixed books, so I'm not coming up with anything clever here because everyone's read mixed book. But, you know, I believe that's the history of it. Um, it's telling that a character like The Fiend, you know, has taken on a version of it because that kind of fits that character as well. I'm never keen on people taking a famous finisher such as, you know, I think Kevin Owens is good enough to not have to do the stunner, for example. Um, but the Fiend kind of works doing the Mandible Claw. But I just Absolutely think does. It's, too, it, it's twofold with Mick because the Mandible Claw is ridiculously devastating and debilitating. And then you put a sock on his hand and it's still massively over in a totally different way. I think it has to be considered the same move. It's the same person applying the move. Um if you want to tell me that the mandible claw is different from the Socko claw, we can have that fight. But I believe nope. it's, du it's doubly impressive that Mick, that move is still over. And it was, it started, it was over after two weeks in 1996 and it's still over. If he applied it now on Monday night, Raw in 2020. Mate, it ticks all the boxes. It's, um, you know, it goes back to what we were saying earlier about Doinkin perfectly fitting his character. Obviously I'm not comparing the success of Doink and Mankind, but they were both well, character it? heels. They were both not the, character not the success, heels. Not the success, but I mean, the first six months of Doink and the first six months of Mankind are comparable. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely they are. Um, just one second, guys. You right, sweetheart? Oh, it's all right. No, it's all right. I thought I had an interruption there. Um, no, 100%. And I think that it, you know, one of the other key considerations is it's so easy to perform on absolutely anyone. Mm -hmm. You know, it was a really simple move to do and execute. And it looked like it. Can you imagine? You could say so these certain moves you can just feel, can't you, in your bones? Like, we're, again, like we were talking about the stump pull, and that just yeah. bloody hurts. Um, fits, and, and, and it's iconic, you know. Think of how many big matches he, he either won or, you know, had really close near falls with that thing. Like you say, even to this day. And a really good point, like you say, that I'd not considered was that um, – it was just equally as over as a baby face move as well. Um, it never crossed my mind that, but it absolutely was. You, like you say, you stick the claw on it, stick the sock on it, it becomes a completely different purpose for the move, but it worked just as well. So yeah, I'm, I'm in a hundred percent agreement that the mandible claw um, moves forward. Good. Okay. We do need to do a bit of uh, rattling through here. Cause we've still got a lot on this list. Yeah, we um, have in, in no more than 10 or 20 seconds. Um, uh, Dean Malenko's Texas Cloverleaf. Great move from a fantastic technical wrestler. I can't think of any important moments where he applied it. Me neither. Um, if we were doing a, te if we were doing this as a in wrestling school, you know, to a, to a whole bunch of 18, 19 year olds who were learning to become wrestlers, I think it would be on the list in the top three. Yeah, because it's so good, and he's such a technical master. But even in Dean Malenko's long, long reigns as cruiserweight champion in WCW, he won just as many matches with um, inside cradles and float overs and reversals and, and stuff because yeah. he, he was a wrestler. Um, it's a great move. It's not, on the, it's not up here, is it? No, nope, it's not. It's not. Um, um, we probably haven't given that enough that we should do compared to other moves we've talked about. But I think we both come from the same page when we talk about Dean Malenko. Yeah, um, I'm going to put one forward now. Similar, make it, let's make it snappy, but let's talk about it. 
CM Punk's Anaconda Vice. Anaconda Vice. That was the next one I was going to go to. <laughs> uh, we're on the same page tonight. I almost feel that anyone who has... If you just say every single wrestler, and you're only allowed one finisher for them, if you if I said to you CM Punk, you'd, you'd say to me the, the, the GTS. Now, you can argue till the cows come home that that's Kenta's move. Um, you can say he didn't really use it before WWE. I don't care. CM Punk, as an over wrestler, uses the GTS. Yep. I'm not erasing his history. I'm not forgetting the summer of Punk in ROH. I'm not saying he didn't use the Anaconda Vice in WWE. But it's just it just was not an over finisher on the biggest stage. So I, I, can't, I, I can't have it. I can't have it. Nope. Agreed. If, I think if, it's almost a rule. If, if the person has two finishing moves, as in a, a knockout move and a submission move, one is always going to take precedence. Like, you're either right-footed or you're left-footed. Do you know what I mean? It's like, even if you're good with oh. your left foot, your right foot takes right. over or whatever. And to me, something always has to take precedence. And in this case, it's the, it's the GTS and not the Anaconda Vice. I think there's an exception to that rule, mate. There's an exception to every rule, but go on. Kurt Angle. Yeah, okay, I'll give you that. I'll but it is the that. exception. It is the exception. I completely agree with what you're saying. But you're right, Kurt Angle but I would be... Bet, uh, I bet he won way more matches with his ankle lock than he did with the Olympic Slam. I suspect he did once he got in his groove. Yeah. Yeah. I think it, tra- yeah, I think yeah. it transitioned. A little bit along the lines of, in 1993, what was Shawn Michaels' finishing move? It was the uh, side suplex. Once he discovered his super kick, actually he used to use a super kick in the matches, yeah, but the, yeah. finisher, the finisher was a side suplex. After he first started using Sweet Chin Music, how many moves, matches did he win with the side suplex? Well, quite. Not a single one. How, how about none? And, yep. and I would suggest, I'm not saying that Angle won no matches with the Olympic Slam, Angle Slam. But, but it became a transition move. I, agree. I, think, I think anybody that's watched Kurt Angle, certainly since he moved to TNA, let's say from TNA onwards, you said, what's Kurt Angle's finisher? They say it's Angle Lock. Yeah. I think Kurt would say it's the ankle lock. I think he absolutely would. Let's do that then. Let's talk about that. Yeah, well, that was that was the idea. So, when you talk about the ankle lock, there's obviously two names that come to mind: Kurt Angle, Ken Shamrock. I mean, it's hard to. It's hard. I, I think. I think Shamrock's is better. I think in some ways it's, it looks the actual ankle lock. The, the the first part of it looks more devastating. I feel he managed to do it in such a way. Um, that it looked he his eyes were popping out of his head and it looked like he was trying to rip their ankle off. I think it was more important to his character, you know, the way that the, the whole Ken Shamrock thing was that he had that red mist and he sort of went into the zone and whatever. Yep. So I think it's more important to Kurt, uh, to Ken Shamrock, but Kurt Angle is so much more important in the history of wrestling than Ken Shamrock. The uh, the most important thing that Ken Shamrock ever did was be a referee before he actually started his career. Um, he could have been much more than he was, whether that was to do with him or to do with his push is another matter. He was a huge star because he was a semi-main eventer during the, one of the biggest eras of wrestling. Yeah. But there's never been a great Ken Shamrock match, not one. Um, and if there was a match that he was in a high profile match, the other guy, for example, the rock was the one that was the focus and where they were, where they, where they were trying to go. Um, yep. So therefore, I just can't have Ken Shamrock for this list because of the fact that I just I don't think he's important enough. Um, I, I I agree, but I did but I did love his ankle lock. I think it's a really if you, I, I I agree what you said. I think it's a really if but if you were to purely say which was the better ankle lock, I think it's a very difficult question because, like you said, with with Shamrocks. I love the way that he, you know, they called, they said he snapped, didn't they? Yeah, he snapped. When he did it. Snapped, yeah. And the eyes, like you said, the eyes bulged. And it was almost like the ankle lock was like, you know, you could almost imagine your opponents trying to run away. Once Ken, once Ken Shamrock had snapped, that was it. You weren't going to win. You just had to get away. And that ankle lock was him stopping you getting away. And the kindest thing you could possibly do to yourself was tap out. Kurt Angle, when he first started using it, I think was a lesser move. Because he just didn't look look like he had that same intensity 
ironically enough, um, <laughs> where, when he applied it. Um, I thought it was I thought it was less than Sharks. By the way, if you look at pictures of applying it side by side, it's scary how identical it looks. Their form when applying it is identical um, when you put on that move. But I think it changed for Kurt Angle, um, similar to the similar sort of time, basically when he went to ECW, right? When he went to ECW around that time, a bit before maybe when he was playing that heel role in sort of mid to late 2005, he got that extra level of nastiness. It went into his TNA run as well, but that sort of goofy out of the ring Kurt went away and he became a he became a killer. He became a he became an absolute psychotic's the wrong word because that's never what there was never the character, but an intense killer. Um Single when he put, minded. there you go. And when he put that ankle lock on then, especially with that second stage that you talk about with the grapevine, that was a whole different story. And that that was the best ankle lock. You know, I you know it's almost like two separate you were talking about the mandible claw being the same move, whether it had the sock on or not. I agree with Kurt Angle. There was almost two different ankle locks and mm. that second one was far superior to the first. So yes, definitely. I agree with you that it's angles that should be put forward rather than shamrocks, yeah, but I'm based, but I'm basing that. If, if you took away that later career period and just had his first sort of four years of the ankle lock or whatever it was, I'd, it'd be a much more difficult question. Much yeah, closer, I agree. closer to battle. But, that's that's not the case. So it's angle. It's a, yeah, and it's a, it's a it's a fun chat as well. It's a really fun yeah. chat. When we might we might want to a little bit more. We might need to. Uh, right. Okay. Let's do another quite a big one. Let's do Hell's Gate. Yeah. Let's do Hell's Gate. Um, I mean, it's, I I mean it's big, it's big, it, it, listen, it's big because it's Taker. Yeah. Exactly. You know, and it finished. Ma- ta- and it finished matches. It, whatever Taker would do. Um, you know, it would seem something, but I'm thinking this. If you think about the history of big guys, I'm talking seriously big guys in WWE, right? I'm not going way, way back. I'm, I'm talking about yeah. early nine. Like, I always think of you know, in football, they often do the Premier League era, right? Yeah, yeah, and yeah. I know football, football existed before 1992 and wrestling existed before 1985. But the WrestleMania era is quite a good starting point. And if you go with all the big guys, not a lot of them had submission moves. You know, we're, what we're talking about here. But you think about big dudes. You know, you talk about your Diesels and your Sids and your Bundys and your Yokozunas. And, you know, they didn't have fit, uh, submission moves. Even Hogan, you know, whoever, mm. Berserker. I don't know, God knows whoever else is, you know. Of course they didn't. Kane, none of them have got submission holds. Because the idea, oh, Yoko had that bloody awful nerve hold that he would use. But oh, God, that yeah. Looked, that, was, that, looked, was rest ridiculous. that was a rest hold. That was a rest hold. That looked ridiculous. I hate that term, but that's exactly what it was. Yeah. Um, but take a, all right, he's the first ever, you know, MMA zombie. But if you follow his character, correct character transitions. But, you know, I believe it, um, you, you know, exponentially more about uh, mixed martial arts than I do, Paul, as I'm not a follower, but. Am I right in the sense that it's called a go-go platter? Is that what it's called in, in UFC? Go-go platter, I think, yes. How, how, however it's pronounced, but spelled Semantics, G-O-G-O-P-L-A-T-A. Yeah. Correct. That's kind of what it is, isn't it? And I know that Undertaker is, a, is a, an advocate of, the, of that sport. I think he's even suggested in the past he would have done it had it been around when he was younger. Um, so it's obviously looking to... So it's a real move, isn't it? Like that, that, is yeah, the, yeah. that is a move that real fighters... You know, I, I could start mentioning names like McGregor and Silver and others and Cormier and whatever, and you tell me I've got the wrong sort of fighter, but that is something that someone in a legit UFC fight could could use, isn't it? Yep, absolutely, no question about it. So it's a it's a real move. It has the legitimacy. It's been part of like big iconic moments, WrestleMania main events, um, all over the show. Like there's there's no real reason why we should exclude this move from the list, apart I from it. I think. I, Oh, go. I love it. Apart from two things for me. Oh, interesting. One, as you mentioned earlier, when you talk about Undertaker finishing moves. Oh, yeah. Yeah, good point. If, if you ask 100 per- people what the Undertaker's finishing move is, 94 of them will say the Tombstone. Five of them will say the last ride. Oh, One of them the will top. say Hell's Gate. 
I one of them say, this. well, was that was never a finisher. That. that was never a finisher for him. That was never a finisher. Um, one of them will say that the Hell's Gate. Um, secondly, and this is a purely personal reason, I just associate it with the period of Taker's career that I like the least, frankly, in terms of his character, not so much his ring work. Um, so that is purely personal. I don't expect anyone to take that into account other than me. But for for mainly for the mainly for the reason that it's a second remove for him and not iconic. I would I put it forward to this to this next stage? Yes. Would it go in my top five? Clearly not. I've talked myself out of that, haven't I? You have a little bit, mate. You have a little bit. Because I love it. And I would have had it very high on my list. But it's hard to argue against that. Your second bit is irrelevant about whether or not you like the character. But the first part about me saying that the other, you know, ooh, it, could be an, it could be an exception, like we said about Kurt, but... Well, let's let's move it forward and see we'll where we move it forward, land. but I can see it. Get, I can see it falling by the wayside. Um, I'm going to go through all the ones on my list, which are the ones that I think are just going to. Uh, well, we're just going to move them on. Um, in fact, I might only have a couple actually. Um, uh, I've got down the Muta Lock, Great Muta's Muta Lock um, mm-hmm. was looked fantastic. Um, more recently, it's more similar to the Emma Lock that Emma would do yep. in NXT. Surprising how few people have actually copied that over the years. Mm, yeah. Um the, the Mutalock. Um but it, it it warrants a mention, but no more. Um let me see. Actually that might actually be it in terms of the uh I've, the, the I've got more one. Th- the more throwaway ones. I think I've got oh no, I was, we mentioned it earlier on, but I, I think we ought to mention the camel clutch. Yes. And we ought to mention how many people have used the camel clutch effectively over the years including the Iron Sheik to win a world title with the famous yeah, um, yeah. Uh, towel getting thrown in by Arnold Skoland, you know, for, for Backland. Uh, I mentioned it in terms of Slaughter using it effectively. More recently, Rusev, who probably has done the best version of it, I think. Agreed, um, technically, yep. But I would, I would struggle to say that it's more... To me, the camel clutch is a wrestling move that several people have used as opposed to someone's move. Do you know what I mean? I kind of do. I think if I had to give it to someone, it'd be the Iron Sheik. Um, purely because he won a world title with it. Purely because he won the world title. But I think I agree. I don't, you know, I, I think it's a real nasty looking move. I think it's a really strong submission move. But yeah, I don't, I don't think I'd move it further forward on this one. No. There's several others that would come into a similar sort of chat. Things such as a, a dragon sleeper. And various others that are, you know, are in unbelievable looking moves. An Indian death lock. Yep. Um, you know, various other things. We never mentioned Jack Swagger when it came to ankle locks, by the way, but there's probably a reason for that. Um, mm. There's various other, submi- there's lots of other submission holds that we won't have mentioned. So you can write in with your suggestions of um, submission holds. But I think broadly speaking, um, you know, we, we've covered everything. I have got, let me see, one... Two, I think I've got three left. I've got one, two, three, four, five. Okay, let's you go then because uh, let's well, see the, what two that, the, the two that I the, the two that I think I've got that you won't will be first of all, one that I don't think we should move on at all, but I want to mention is John Cena's STFU. Oh, yeah, well, I mean, okay, yeah, fair dues. Yeah, it's you know, it's a, it's a big move, a big part of his arsenal, and um. Yeah, he's quite a big star. Um, the other one that I think would mer- merit consideration, I don't think you've got the master lock. No, I haven't got that. And I knew you were going to mention it at some stage. But again, to me, to me, that's just a full Nelson. It is. And that's why it should go no further, really. But if you're talking about full Nelsons, you talk about all the guys that have used that over the years. Chris Masters is the master of the full Nelson. It is the best there's ever been. Yeah, I would agree with that. Although that being said, off the top of my head, the only other one I can really think of is the Warlord. Billy Jack um, Haynes. Billy Jack Haynes no, okay, famously okay. used that. Uh, uh, yeah, good point. He did. In, okay, Billy Jack Haynes. But again, how high did Billy Jack Haynes get on the uh, on the list of uh, wrestlers of all time? Oh, Black Blood there. Um, true, true. From Port... Where, where was he from? Oregon or something. Um, in Oregon. Yeah, uh, it's... I No, I just, I just think Chris Masters is not... Not any, I understand why they did the whole mass lot challenge. The mass lot challenge was fun. Yes, um, it was a good gimmick, uh, but 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 no, I'm not having that. And as far as the SDF goes, again, the SDF is one of those moves that lots of people. Again, that 
it's a regal, regal stretch is a version of the STF. If we were doing the STF, regal stretch is the best version of it. Regal would go through. Um, but you're, you're right to mention it because it's a C. But it, once again, Cena, it falls into that same category as what's, what's John Cena's finishing move? Yeah, exactly. It's the old attitude adjustment, isn't it? It's not the, exactly. It's not the STF. So, so the last three I've got. Not, it goes no further. The last three I've got are going to be the same as your three, I'm sure. And they're three automatic moves forward. Okay, well, let's say them quickly and then we'll do them as the first part of the next stage because we need to rattle through this. Yes, so we do. I'm assuming that the same three that you have as me are uh, Bret Hart's sharpshooter. Yes. Chris Jericho's Walter Jericho. Yep. And Bob Batlin's chicken wing. Absolutely correct. Let's start with the last one. How similar is the chicken wing to the Ascalock? Uh, very similar indeed, but but miles more over and miles better. And I love Asuka, but uh, but Bob Backlund's crossface chicken wing is just stunningly good, especially when he was in his heel character. Bob Backlund's chicken wing. Remember what I said about twenty minutes ago that without the Taz mission. Peter Sinertia is an enhancement talent. Same. Without the chicken wing crossface, Bob Backlund comes back as a milky white 43-year-old man who loses to Razor Ramon at WrestleMania 9 in six minutes and everyone forgets about it. Correct. Let's just think about that. He, he wrestles for nearly an hour in the Royal Rumble of 93. At the following pay-per-view, he's just jobbed out completely. And by the end of the year, he's the world champion. Okay, only for a couple of days, but that's not the point. The, Still the, remarkable. The, transi the transition in the summer or the early part of the summer and throughout the summer of 1993 of Bob Backlund, which started with a match that Brett and Bob Backlund had on, I think, Superstars, which was a sort of a 12-minute match or so, which was basically no fighting. There weren't punches and kicks yep. it was move after hold after transition after reversal lovely stuff brett wins backland slaps his face rather than shaking his hand and puts him in the chicken wing the chicken wing crossface is as much to do with backland's application of it it is as much there's the same amount of credit goes to vince mcmahon to gorilla monsoon to the king jerry lawler to bob back uh, to bobby heenan the commentary got that move over. Big time. Big so did time. Backland. So did Backland. And so it all fits into our little melting pot. So it's not a detraction. The commentary got that move over. Do you remember they would do stuff? He would like, I think he got given an award by some magazine writer and he put the chicken wing on them. Arnold yes, Scoland Vin apologized. Oh, Arnold Vince Scoland Russo. Apologized for, was it Russo, was it? Yeah. Vince was Russo. Really? Yeah. I didn't even, I didn't know that. Um, uh, Arnold Scoland, his old manager, came and apologised for throwing the towel in. Back and put the chicken wing on him. He put the chicken wing on everybody that year. The the chicken wing being put on people was the stunner three years, four years, five years before the stunner. Yeah, well, obviously Austin with very different ideas. It. Of course it was a different idea, but, it, but the whole thing of Austin just stunning everyone in sight, Santa Claus, Vince, JR, whoever, that was Backlund was doing it. I can remember two or three occasions where Randy Savage burst out of his commentary position to try and help whoever it was that was getting the poor chicken wing put on them. Technical um, people and everybody, that got Backland over. And then Survivor Series 1993. Four. Brett was in it for too long. 94, sorry. Brett was in it for too long. Was it 94? Yep. 94. Crikey. So it's a lot longer than... So that's a longer transition. You're right, actually. It is 94. Hmm. Um, so it's, long, it's longer than I thought in terms of going from WrestleMania 9. But, you know, point taken. Um, you know, it's extraordinary how, uh, how that move, you know, how that, that whole thing came about and yeah, just, um, I, I, it walks onto my list. Uh, as mine does too. Um, one second. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. That gives us 13. Does it really? It's a good number, isn't uh, it? 13 with a very easy couple to knock off. So just to, just to right, give okay, you the well, 13. Yeah, go, okay, go on. Well, I don't know. Tell you what, let's knock a few off first, shall we? Let, I, I take it we're going to knock off the bank statement. I would just, I would put the crossface ahead of it. And I don't think, if we were to put both of those on the five, 
realistically, there's more than three that we want to put this on this list. Isn't just it? not so going to happen. Just I not love that statement. Sasha deserves to be in the top ten, but not the top five. Okay, let's knock off also the million dollar dream. Yeah, and therefore the the Cobra Clutch because to me they're they're kind of equals. Yep, agreed. And that leaves us with eleven. So the eleven oh, I've got are name them: Sharpshooter, Bret Hart, Chris Benoit, Crossface, Chris Jericho, Walls of Jericho, The Undertaker's Hell's Gate, Charlotte Flair's Figure Eight, Ronda Rousey's Armbar, Becky Lynch's Disarm Her, Mankind's Mandible Claw, Bob Backlund's Crossface Chicken Wing, Kurt Angle's Ankle Lock, and the Taz Mission. Right, I uh, as a uh, we ju- we've only just talked about backland um and i want him provisionally on the five agreed um let's put backland in at place number five for the time being as we often do put a placeholder in for the five yeah and then see if we can beat beat them we haven't yet talked about jericho or brett no um, we haven't let's talk about brett i think brett's a stone cold certainty for the five agreed um but let's chat about it, we, we, it it's not fair to hardly mention it at all no um, of course I mean, you could argue that uh, Bret Hart uh, did the move after Sting. Mm-hmm. Um, Sting did it first, uh, or did it before Bret anyway, uh, as the Scorpion death lock. Some would say Scorpion leg lock. Um, others say Scorpion death lock, but it's the Scorpion in whichever way. Um, I believe it originally came from uh, Ricky Choshu, the, the, the Japanese wrestler. But um, you know, Sting popularized it in North America. Brett did not, it's not an original, but I don't think there's anything in our rules that say it has to be original. Uh, not. And I think Brett is more synonymous with the sharpshooter than Sting is with the scorpion, although it's close. Mm, yeah, yeah, it all, is, it is. Because it is, that is Sting's move. The scorpion death drop, the old reverse DDT, is a later Sting move. It's a, it's a crow era Sting move. Yep, agreed. You know, it, it's not in the, the kind of golden era of blonde Sting. Um, it's not in his arsenal. It's a later Sting thing. So I would still say is the the the, the Scorpion Deathlock is the you know is the Sting move. Um, Agreed. But I think Brett. I think Brett did it better. Um, I think Brett's application of it is better. I think the anticipation of Brett holding someone's legs and looking around is better. And I think just as much as anything is that of all of the people that we've mentioned so far, how many of them built up to that move? You know, we can go through all of these moves, but just rattle through. I'm just going to do them right in front of my eyes. But the chicken wing, the ankle lock, the kimura, the cross face, the figure four, the mandible claw, the torture about the stump puller, the sleeper, the transmission, blah, 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 blah. How many of those wrestlers built their entire match around that move? Not many. Correct. Not many. You know, mankind wasn't working on someone's jaw. And even, nope. you know, Ric Flair didn't do a lot of work on the legs. Brett worked the leg. And it was Agreed. an integral part of Brett match after Brett match. When he got on top, he did the figure four. He wrapped them in the ropes. He um, he dropped the elbow. He, everything he did built that. It was logic. Listen, folks, you know me. I can do five hours on Brett Hart and I won't. But that was what Brett was all about, the logic. And that move was, a, was an end goal. That is what he tried to get to. If you're a football team and your your big thing is you've got a big centre forward, you get the ball wide and you get crosses in. Well, Brett got the ball wide and then his cross into the fin- final, and the final, the finish was was the sharpshooter. I don't think it's to me. It's not a discussion. It's going to go in the five unless we have a massive reason for for three or four others. Um, and and as much as I love Sting's one, I just don't think Sting has the Sting's not a technical enough wrestler for me to to push his way to the to this list. I completely agree. You know, one of the most iconic finishes of all time has been used umpteen massive moments. And if you had to pick someone who does a sharpshooter, is it Sting or is it Bret Hart? It's Bret Hart every and day I mean, of the week. There's plenty of other people that have used them, by the way. Um, obviously, Natty these days and, and The Rock and Benoit and Cesaro and Tyson Kidd and you yep. know, numerous others. Um, but... Um, you know, there's there's been plenty of examples, but I mean, it's, it's, it's Brett. Brett. whoever, it's even Brett. if someone uses it, even if the next up and coming 19 year old wrestler uses it tomorrow and is champion for 20 years, still Bret Hart's move. Of course it is. Well, it'll be called the sharpshooter and he named it the sharpshooter. So that says it all, doesn't it? That says it all. Ve- um, very fair point. Right. Um, we need to do Jericho. Yeah, we do. But I'm looking at this list now 
And I'm thinking, I'm not sure it cuts it. No, but we need to give it due deference. We need to give it its little nod. Um, what I will say, here's a question for you, because I'm not sure of the answer to this. Mm. And I've read people suggest that they are sure, but I'm not. What is the difference, if any, between the Lion Tamer and the Walls of Jericho? Very good point. Uh, the knee to the back, essentially. Okay. The Lion Tamer was much more vertical. The, um, with the knee in, it was a. In fact, I say it's the lion tamer that goes on rather than the walls of Jericho. The walls of Jericho was more like a stand-up Boston crab, um, and it was a good move, but it didn't have quite the same viciousness as the lion tamer did. But then you can argue that the lion tamer was on a much smaller stage. He did that when he was cruiserweight division WCW. He did the did the uh, walls of Jericho when he was winning undisputed world titles in WWE. So. Um, Purely as a move, the lion tamer to me is is head and shoulders above. I don't but, think there's a difference. I think if you ask Chris Jericho, he would say that they're essentially the same thing. And I would say that the people he was using the lion tamer on were able to get into the position that he wanted to get them on. That is to say, a Dean Malenko, a Rey Mysterio, whoever else in WCW, and that when he was wrestling Big Show and Kane, and Triple H, and The Rock, and Austin, they were bigger guys with neck issues, mm, and they true. did not want to go into the Lion Tamer as it was in its old days. I'm fairly certain if you take some very original Chris Jericho squash matches, enhancement matches, in 1999, I think you'll find he's using what you would call the Lion Tamer with the neck bent over and the knee in the back, and it's called the Walls of Jericho. It was never, ever, ever called the Lion Tamer by the com by the commentators in W in WWE. I do remember awesome. Steve Austin referring to it as the Lion Tamer once on in a promo. But it, the Walls of the Lion Tamer in WWE world does not exist. There are basically no. two versions of the Walls of Jericho. One is just a Boston crab, and one is with the neck bent over. Look, I've. I've broken our rule. We weren't going to go into too many stupid details about moves and stuff. But what I'm saying is I'm actually defending it. I am saying that the Lion Tamer Wars of Jericho to me is one move. And it's just, it's a, it's a Boston crab with various degrees of, of how you put it on. Fair enough. That said, does it carry on on this journey? <sighs> I want it to, but I think ultimately we're going to find a couple too big for it i fully agree and in the interest of moving some of these away from the list because we have still got a lot on there yeah hell's gate hell's gate it's got to go because of your reason i mean because of my reason which then you then brought up but i i think instinctively i think i probably would have had it very 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 near the top five but i made the point about it being someone's finisher and mm. it's not take as finisher it, it, so so in a very in a very competitive market, it's not on the list. Iron margins matter. I agree. So look, we've got two on there that we think are pretty definitive. We've got seven left to fill three spots, essentially. But sharpshooters in, chicken wings in. And I don't think anything's dislodging them. Okay. So I, want, I, want, I want the mandible claw in. Okay. I don't see how you can knock the mandible claw as a move that's been over for 24 years that's got two versions of it, that's won big matches, that without it, Foley wouldn't be who he is. Um, it was different. It was innovative. Um, I, I just think it's, I think it just stands up mass. If you compare it, for example, with Hell's Gate, where would Undertaker be without Hell's Gate? Well, Taker would be fine. Yes. Where would, where would Mick be without the Mandible Claw? We don't know. Arguable. Because it got, Arguable. Because it got, because, because it got mankind over. And mankind getting over leads to Dude Love and Cat Jack and Mick Foley and the Commish and everything. Because if mankind had a flopped in year one, then Mick Foley would be about as famous to us now as, I don't know, Mike Shaw, you know? Mm, yeah. I know where you're going with it. I'm not sure I necessarily agree, but I, could, I, I totally buy your argument. So... It's quite a simple equation from here on in there, mate. We've got six left, two spots. Just to remind you, those six are the Crippler Crossface, the Figure Eight, the Disarmer, the Armbar from Ronda Rousey, the Ankle Lock, and the Tasmission. 
We've got two spots left. For me, Let, for are me, we get, we want to get rid of a couple first. I, I think we should get rid of a couple, and I would start with getting rid of um, Charlotte Fair's figure eight. Okay, I wouldn't I just, have got rid of that, but the fact that you have, um, it's not. I it's not going to make. We're at a high enough level here that we need to we need to both agree on things. If one of us doesn't agree, it goes. And you said that one straight up. I think you're probably um, right. So I I might have her jersey on, but I think Becky. I just said about without the mandible claw, mankind doesn't get over. Without the disarmor, I think Becky's okay. Becky does. I don't think I it's agree. integral. To, I don't think it's integral to. I would I would have Charlotte on my list before I have Becky on my list. Fair enough. And you've just got rid of Charlotte, and I've got Becky below Charlotte. So if that's the ruling. We'll 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 move both of them on. Okay. Well, I want to pick Poor one left. for the list now. As soon as you pick the mandible claw, yeah, I'm going to make. Okay. I'm going to make. So we've got we've got the crossface, the armbar, the anchor lock, and the transmission. It's really tough. This it's really it's really really, really tough. hard now, isn't it? Um, because I I really desperately want to see Ronda Rousey's armbar on there, but I just don't think I can. Oh, okay. I mean. I don't know if I can. It wouldn't, it, wouldn't like, ups, it wouldn't upset me if you did. Hmm. Say the four again. Say the four that we've got left. Crossface, armbar, ankle lock, transmission. The problem is, if you put the armbar on there, one of the crossface and the ankle lock's got to go. See, funnily enough, do you know what I would pick next? The transmission. Mm. I really would. I think we should discount the transmission, be just Why? because it's just because of the level it got to. I think, like you say, we're in rarefied air here, and there's a real stiff competition to get two more slots. And okay, by one in of that our case, criteria. Okay, in that case, I agree with you. I agree with you, but in that case, Ronda's got to go. I don't disagree with that. Because she's only she she wrestled for a year. I don't disagree with that, which makes our job incredibly easy. And I would argue that Taz in ECW plus his Royal Rumble win is as much on the level of Ronda Rousey's year. Forget the fact that she was ever her the fact that she was in the fact that she was the biggest star in her industry, and she was the biggest star in her industry at one point. Yep. Um, is irrelevant. Absolutely irrelevant. What matters is the first day she stepped into a WWE ring and onwards. And that move was over. But the, her character was over. She could have done a different move. Mm. She was UFC star Ronda Rousey coming in. And if her move had been the ankle lock or if her move had been, you know, whatever. I, I think it's it's... I don't think her entire time, when in for fifty years' time, it's going to be a bit of a throwaway year. Whereas I think the others, I, the test, the test of time, and the level that they got to, I think, you know, I think play a huge part. I think you're right, and I really did want to include it, but I was, very, you know, I was hesitating, and I think what you said makes perfect sense. So I think let's, that makes. Let's that. address this. Right, let's address. I'm going to address this right into the camera. I think you wanted her to go in this list of five because you wanted female representation in it, right? No, 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 no wait, 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 no, I mean it in a, I mean it in a really positive way. We recognize now over the last three, four, five years that women's wrestling is as credible, equally as credible as male wrestling. It's main event in a WrestleMania. Becky Lynch was a huge star. Ronda Rousey was very over. We have listed not because we're trying to be PC, but we have listed Charlotte and we've listed Asuka and we've listed Sasha Banks and we've knocked off loads of female wrestlers. I even mentioned Lorna Carno at one point. We're not doing it to try and be PC. We're not trying to go, oh, we need to make sure we have some women on this. It is a natural progression of how we have talked about the, the women in the industry. They have a, a legit place these days. If we were doing best submission moves now, we'd probably have three, four, even all five mm. might be women because they're that prominent. I think part of you, as a business owner and as a progressive modern man, wants to recognise that we should have a woman on this list. 
And I'm not saying you're wrong for that. I think that's your gut instinct. I think because we have to take in the entire 100-plus year history of wrestling, and we have to look at who got right up to a top level and produced the goods, I think she misses out. But I think, I think, it's, I think... A pos- it's a positive reason for why you want to do it. And I think if we were doing a top 10, we'd probably have three or four women on it. But I think, I think ultimately, when it comes to the five, I just don't think she justifies it. I think it's more, and you might be right subconsciously, but more in terms of logic. I'm a big fan, especially when it comes to submission wrestlers, of legitimacy. Yeah, no, I agree with that. And I don't think they come any more credible and legitimate than Ronda Rousey in her field, which is why I wanted to recognize that. But the fact is, you're absolutely right in what you say. And the ankle lock and the crippler crossface probably do exactly what the... Um, the armbar did, but better for longer on a higher level. First, first of all, Kurt is credible because he's an Olympic champion, correct? And he and he used that move following Ken Shamrock, who was probably the first UFC star. Yeah, right. So, first of all, that's credible. Secondly, Chris Benoit made his career on being smaller than everyone else, but looking like he could hurt you. And. Therefore, that move, and again, I don't know anyone else that used that move before him either. So, so much there's credibility there. Even with the ones that we've already put on the list, Backland, amateur background, that's what his character, part of his character was based on, and it was a wrestling move. Credible. Brett, son of Stu Hart, the greatest submission guy ever. Credible. Um, Mankind, okay, Mix, not the, the technical guy, but the backstory of the mandible claw and what it's meant to do to your nerves and stuff yeah credible you know if that's your argument and i know i know you're not making that point ahead of the ones that we've said but if that's how you're placing it i could see for example the arm bar ahead of the figure eight for that because in a mm-hmm. fight you would never do the figure eight and um, i could see it ahead of you know cattle mutilations and last chanceries and million dollar dreams and various different things but i think we've got enough if, if the credibility is the issue if the credibility was the it, well, if that was the only thing, we Kimura would have walked into this, and we've not yeah, got yeah. Kimura in our top. The Kimura's not in our top thirteen. Yeah, and Brock used the Kimura more effectively for longer than Ronda did using the armbar, and we've not even yeah, put Brock in the top thirteen. You're absolutely right, and look, you look at the final five. I'm more than happy with it. Like I am, I'm not, I'm not in any way sort of upset where we've got to we've got look we've got bob backland's crossface chicken when we've got bret hart sharpshooter we've got mankind's mandible claw kurt angle's ankle lock and chris benoit's crossface that's a really good list that's a really really good list and i wouldn't make an argument for anything ahead of any of them i mean i i I do love the taz mission i absolutely adore the taz mission as a finisher but as do i rules that the rules that we've said i mean who are we talking about here bret hart Argument for the greatest wrestler of all time. Mankind, one of the greatest character wrestlers of all time with a move that we've talked about standing the test of time. Backland, okay, Backland might be the, the, the question mark on this list mm. in terms of Bob Backland, the champion, might have been six, seven, eight years or whatever in the 1970s and 80s. But we're talking about crazy Bob Backland of 1994, which is a short-lived run. So you could easily be saying, Rob, you're, you're, you're dismissing Ronda for being a, only a year. Backland no. wasn't a year. I can understand the argument, but that chicken wing was everything about Bob Backlund, whereas Ronda was Ronda, and the armbar was a small part. Backlund yep. was the fucking chicken wing. And that's why I liked the Taz mission, because it fit the character more the same way as I'm saying about Backlund. Agreed. You know, when you, and you to talk about all those, Kurt Angle, you can't talk about Kurt Angle being an, anything other than a huge legend, you know, for more than one company and for an Olympics. And say what you like about Benoit, we've already addressed Benoit and his personal life. But as an in-ring wrestler, what did you say earlier on about Becky? Obviously, we went down a different road. But the cross, uh, sorry, the, the the crippler crossface won the main event of one of the most iconic WrestleManias of all time. Certainly did WrestleMania twenty. Certainly you know, did. Therefore, it's hard to argue against any of them. You know, the the Lion Tamer Wars of Jericho, the Hell's Gate. You know, all of these things are absolutely genuine. You know, we 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 basically started on Ric Flair's you know figure four. And in the end, you know, that's going to struggle to get in our top 15. Oh, because we've, indeed. We've come up with so many good ones. Um, and we love the stump puller, but uh, the stump well, pullers are sort there. of a uh, little side award. But it's not a bad five, mate. 
Hey, it's great. I think we should. I'm looking forward to getting this up. I think it's going to be really close. There's a broad range of eras and styles there, and the standard's so high, so high. So give me the five again. Give me the five. We've again. got Bob Backlund's crossface chicken wing, Bret Hart sharpshooter, Mankind's mandible claw, Kurt Angle's anchor lock, um, and Chris Benoit's crossface. It's an Bloody unbelievable good. list. It's an unbelievable it really list. Really is. I want. I want the Taz Mission in there. I want the Figure Eight in there. I want the Walls of Jericho in there. I want the Hell's Gate in there. There's only room for five, and I'm very, very happy with the five that we've come up with. Um, that was a lot of fun. I love submission wrestling. I love talking Super. about the the aspects of wrestling that feel real, that feel logical. And it's nice to think, actually, that quite a lot of the ones we talked about are still around. Um, True. There might have been others that we've missed off that are common, current moves um if we've missed them off it's probably because they've not necessarily stood the test of time yet it might be that in the future those sort of things come in it might that we might be that we've made some other egregious mistakes and we've left things off completely if we have we have we've done our best uh, to cover that particular uh, strand of wrestling and i had a lot of fun doing so as well you can now vote so by the time this goes up on our youtube channels and on our podcast places we should have timed it so that there is now something on the website which directs you, and we can tell you that you can now go to hookedonwrestling.co.uk forward slash vote. There you will find the list of five that we have just told you about, and you can vote for the one that you would like to vote for. And please feed back to us, tweet us, send us a message on Facebook, and say, why did you leave that one off? I voted for this one because we still want to hear your feedback on it. It's very important to us. Who do you think is going to win, Paul? Um, great question. Gun to my head. If in doubt, vote Bret Hart. Yeah, I think I think Bret wins, but I think it's a great. I mean, but listen, I would never have said, I would never have said Terry Gordy would win the last one, even though I would have wanted him to. So, great fun. Um, our, I am not going to steer you anywhere. This, and I am the biggest Bret Hart fan. You'll find, but I'm not steering you to Bret here. I think there's lots of credible candidates for this. I think it's a great discussion. I wouldn't be upset with any of these five winning. Um. Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, remember that there are bundles of podcasts on the Hooked on Wrestling podcast network. Um, please check them out. Uh, I believe it's hookedonwrestling.co.uk forward slash podcasts, um, which will give you a full list of everything that we've got going on. We've got old school British stuff. We've got up to date stuff. Um, we've got retro reviews. We've got a lot. Uh, we've got old WCW. We've got lots of different things on the, on the podcasts. Uh, so go and check those out. Our favorite day, time of the week is eight o'clock on the Sunday night. That's one me and Paul build our entire week round now. It's the Sunday night quiz. It's roughly speaking eight o'clock till half past nine here on YouTube live for those of you that are watching this at the moment, but it's live on eight o'clock on a Sunday night. Uh, It's the Hooked on Wrestling quiz. Some would say it's me versus Paul, but more importantly, it's me and Paul setting the questions for everyone to join in. The last couple of weeks, we've had some little nice little bits to give away. Have we got something in the giveaway this week, mate? Have we, have we still we have got some indeed. swag? We've got a brand new Jeff Hardy t-shirt courtesy of WWE Euroshop. Have we? Oh, I didn't know that. That's a, I we wasn't have even building in, to that. We have indeed. So we've got every week now, we're going to have a new t-shirt from WWE Euroshop to give away. And this week, it's um, it's Jeff Hardy. So oh, um, well worth tuning in for. I like that a great deal. In the past couple of weeks, we've given away some Undertaker stuff that Paul was drinking from earlier on. Uh, so, and, and by the way, it's not the quiz winner. We do have a quiz winner. We enjoy working out who's won, but the winning is for fun. The giveaway yeah. is just for being part of it. So it's a random giveaway. Just by taking part in all 20 questions, you could win our swag. So a huge thank you to wweeuroshop.com uh, for helping us provide those things. And we will see you for that on Sunday night. Remember to check out hookedonwrestling.co.uk for all sorts of things, for news, for reviews, for features, for comedy, for seriousness, for all sorts of things. I've now made it a little bit of a bookmark. I now get up in the morning, I pick my phone up, I check my email, I check my Twitter, I check my Facebook, and I check Hooked on Wrestling, and then I get up and do my day's Love it. Um, Love it. It's become part of my day. Uh, and I say that as someone I don't really contribute to the web- website, so I'm more of a podcast guy and a, and a quiz guy. So I can say that as a genuine thing. It's something that I do. So it's uh, it's great fun. Um, anything else to add, Paul, before we uh, knock it on the head for another week? Nope, that's all for me, mate. I think it's been a really good topic, as always. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Um, the audience is growing week on week. Makes this all worthwhile. Um, and thanks to you, mate. Thanks for your time, as always. 
Ooh, and thank you to everyone for. <laughs> What's that? Oh, is that, is that Dizzy? <laughs> Hello, Dizzy. Dizzy makes his podcast debut. The tail of the tape, right at the, the end. There. That was just the tail of Dizzy. What does it? Who is Dizzy? What does this mean for the future? <laughs> when will he debut? Or will we find out in the future? <laughs> oh, is that, how many, oh, uh, the different cameos you get. If it's not your son, it's your cat making. Uh, I know, mate. I know. And the, the only TV, the only actual, the only actual TV personality in the family, and uh, she's not been on yet. I'm going to say yes, but yes. But Paul's wife is actually genuinely a proper journalist on the telly. Um, she's, <laughs> she's, she's she's better than the rest of us, but she stays off of this quite rightly. Anyway, yes. thank you very much for everyone for tuning in. Uh, we'll be back with another podcast uh, next week. Um, if you want to be the first to find out what the topic is, another good reason to tune into the quiz because I always give you the topic uh, on the Sunday night during the quiz to uh, so you can start to think about it and get involved. Thank you to everyone that sent uh, suggestions in. Um, we don't read everyone's uh, tweets and Facebook comments out, but we absolutely read them all uh, and take it into our account into account when we're making our list. And so, thank you to everyone for doing that. It's a lot of thank yous, but it's all been worth uh, worth doing because we really appreciate everybody. We will be back with more How to Be Great on the podcast next week. Don't forget the quiz on Sunday. But for now, just remember one thing, just one little thing for me. It's wrestling. Enjoy it. See you very soon.